let everybody get settled. We're so excited. It's like a family reunion. Oh, we love our family. Come on, Vicky. Oh. If there wasn't tension, it wouldn't be as beautiful. So, uh, wow. All right. So, um, everybody got a bulletin, I'm assuming, this morning, or you have a piece of paper. So I know how often we read our bulletins because <laughs> people leave them on their seats. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to be honest, I'm not, um, not going to be your traditional um, speaker. And if it's your first time here today, hello, my name is Amber. I'm not Pastor Chris, who is normally here. He's on a men's retreat. Good for him. Um, <laughs> so we, I want you to get that bulletin or get a piece of paper or get on your phone. And I want you to fill in the blank, I am what? Put any word, one word, two words, four words. Um, I'll give you just a second, but I want everybody to do that because it's important. (laughs) Yes, yeah, I said so. That's what I tell the kids when I used to nanny. I learned it from my mom. Nobody laughed, okay. (laughs) Okay. I said, I, I, I learned it from my mom. I, I said so. Um, <laughs> we're going back to the basics today. I literally wrote notes on paper. Um, and I have my Bible, and a physical Bible. Uh, we're literally going all the way back to Genesis. So if you want to open your book, it's really hard to find. It's probably about page one, four, or six, depending on how many pages they put at the very beginning of your Bible. <laughs> And so open there, and then we're going to, I want, I want you to picture a house and tell me um, when you walk around the house and you look in a window, are you going to see, oh, she's so fine. Let her come to the altar as much as she wants. <laughs> um, so when you look in a window, are you going to see the same thing in every window? No. So each window has a different perspective, right? I need you guys to keep that in mind as we go through the morning. Also, can you hear me? I feel like, okay, great. I should just move this. (sighs) So what is the difference between Eastern and Western is my next question. Can anybody give me an example of what they think culturally um, or perspective-wise the difference might be from an Eastern mindset and a Western mindset? This is a very interactive class, that it's not class, so. (laughs) Languages, thank you, mom. Anybody else? Food, that's a good point, yeah. Dress, yes. Mm Mm-hmm, yeah, like honor. Okay, all right. I don't know who Puffy is, but I'll take your word for it. Okay. (laughs) Um, so when Easterners are teaching, they are discovering. It is, it is games, in a sense. It's a discovery. When Westerners are teaching, it's a topic, and they try to prove a point. Okay? There's a difference. So when Easterners are um, describing God, they are going to describe God as a picture, like a fortress. When you say the word fortress, you automatically have something that pops in your head. Whereas Westerners are going to describe them as big, mighty. It makes it harder to put a picture in your head. How big, how big? You know, there's, you can't measure it the same. This is all important because when we get into Genesis, when you get into the Bible, it was not written from a Western perspective. It was written from an Eastern perspective. And the more I dig into it, the more I realize that changes what you hear and what you see. And it changes the weight of what you're learning and reading. So if you're all open to Genesis, um, who would have been hearing Genesis first, who can tell me? I know it's a hard question. Who would be like reading or hearing Genesis first? Israel. I was waiting for you. (laughs) Israel would have. Can you tell us where they would have just come out of? 
or what they just came out of? Egypt. So slavery for about 440 years. Am I Josephus? Yeah, 440 years. Anybody know what they were doing there? Making bricks. Yeah, yeah, this is a fun time. Um, all right, so we just talked about how Easterners and Westerners think differently. And now we're going to jump into Genesis and read it a little bit. <laughs> just read Genesis 1. Um, with that, who... I'm going to switch it up. Okay, so when I was in Sunday school as a kid, it was like Bible race, right? Whoever got there first. But I forgot to do that. So <laughs> um, I guess I'll... We're going to close our Bibles and race there. And once you get there, everybody close your Bible. We're going to race there. This is important, and I will explain more in a, a bit. But everybody's Bible's closed. All right. On the count of three, whoever gets there first, raise your hand. Ready? Three, two, one. Go. Where are we going? Chapter one. Right. Genesis. Where? Literally. Ah, oh, there. You made it. Uh, act like I had candy. Whew. There you go. You got it. Good job. This is important because play is important. It is important to play or you're not going to learn as much. Otherwise, you're going to be sitting there and you're just going to be like, ah, da, da, da. in my language class I'm in right now, I'm learning Hindi. And let me tell you, I've tried learning Spanish multiple times and I've made it pretty far. But the problem was, is I was sitting in a classroom that gave me grammar and letters and instructions. Whereas my Hindi class, I'm playing charades and flashcards and fun games and looking at picture books. And I've learned so much more. And so I keep that in mind of like, when we play, we learn more. So in the beginning, I also want to keep in mind that we have all read this before. It is a, a, is a lullaby. There's a lullaby effect. Because as soon as I said, in the beginning, in your head, you're like, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you automatically are just la, 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 la. And you're not paying attention to what you're reading anymore. Don't allow the lullaby effect to get you this morning. She's so cute. Okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and <laughs> there was morning the first day. Okay, a few things stick out to me. In the beginning, the world was what? Formless. There's nothing. Crazy, right? So day one, he did, did he spend the day creating or separating? Separating. Yeah. Huh. So it was already there. He's just separating things. Go, girl, go. Yes, I love it. Please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that, that imagery. I hope you guys are, remember, this isn't a lab report, okay? We're, East, we're thinking as Easterners. This is poetry, okay? So there's going to be patterns. There's going to be imagery. So I want you to be thinking about that in the midst of this. And so God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening. And there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky gather 
to one place and let the dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and, and, the, ga- and the gathering of waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees. On the land that bear fruit with, with seeds in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seeds according to their kinds. And the trees were bearing fruits and seeds according to their kinds. And, the God, saw that, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening. And there was morning the third day. So... Common thread happening in day one, two, and three. What do you think is happening? Because we already decided day one, did he create or separate? Separate. So day two, what do you do? Create or separate? Separate. Day three, what do you do? Create or separate? Separate. Thank you, Mom. (laughs) Okay, something else that we're noticing. It says there was evening and there was morning. Okay, so Easterners... Or I shouldn't say Eastern. I should say here in the West, how do we, how's our day start? Morning to evening, right? So Josephus, Jewish belief is the day starts when? Evening, evening sunset. We're going to, we got to remember that because it's mentioned in every single day, right? And so it must be important. <laughs> <laughs> and God said, let there be light in the vaults of the sky to separate the day from the night and the light and let them serve as signs. She agrees. I just know it. Her spirit is like, yeah, <laughs> man, <laughs> to mark uh, sacred times and the days and years and let the Sorry, lost my spot. Perfect timing. Good job. Let them be light in the vaults in the sky and give light to the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. So we made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on earth, to govern the day and govern the night, to separate light from darkness, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. Did he create or separate that day? Created. Hmm. Let's see. Also, let's see. That's day four. And on day... Wait, I'm, I wrote this somewhere. Hold on. On day one... He talked about light and darkness, so there's like a trend happening, huh? Day one really matches up with day four, because day one was light, and day four was moon and sky. You're realizing it's kind of like a poem? It literally set up like a poem? I don't know if you ever, if you remember back in school, they had the A, B, C, A, B, C, like rhythm to it. So we're going to look really, we'll go back to that. Hold on. Getting ahead of myself. All right. (laughs) And and God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth, across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creation of the sea and every living thing within, with which the water teems and and that moves. Sorry, guys about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw that it was good God blessed them and said be fruitful and increase in numbers and fill the waters in the sea and let the birds increase on earth and there is evening and there is morning the fifth day and God said let the land produce evening creatures according to their kind the livestock the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And so, and it was so, God made the wild animals according to their kind, the livestock according to their kind, 
and all the creatures that moved along the ground according to their kinds. The, and God saw that it was good. Then he sa said, let us make mankind in our own image, in our likeness, so that they can ru may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God, so God created mankind in his own image, and in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So now we've had day four and five happen, and what did he create or um, separate? Created. Oh, I know. I just love that she's running around up here. I just, I need to say that because I think we talk about coming as ch children and childlike faith. We talk about letting the kids run. But I honestly, I think that baby spirits catch so much more than we realize. And so as they're running around, you're really just teaching them things that when they become teenagers, their spirit's going to be like, no, 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 stop. And, and they're going to be like, but all my friends, and you're going to be like, man, I'm so glad I let my kid run around in church. Something hit their spirit that has stopped them as a teenager from really causing trouble. So this is, I could keep going, I could keep reading, and I think I'm going to highlight, because I, I don't know what time it is, I honestly don't um, remember what time church gets out. <laughs> So we're just going to, I'm going to not slow down because I spent all day on this just having a ball. It was like a kid at a water park. Um, so as you keep going, there's a pattern. The first day matches with the fourth day. The second day matches with, let's see, sky and water. Second day. Doo -doo -doo. Fifth day, fish and the birds. Sixth day goes with the third day. So there's this pattern happening. If you look at your Bible, you have a baby paragraph, a mommy paragraph, daddy paragraph. Then you have a verse 14. You have a daddy paragraph. Verse 20, you have a mommy paragraph. And verse 24, that's supposed to be a baby paragraph. But what happens? Man was created. And women were created. We threw everything off. There's a reason for that. There's a reason that we're looking at morning and evening, and that's what we've been taught, but really it's supposed to be evening and then morning. It's Jewish belief, it starts at sunset because you don't start with production, you start with rest. So I, I manage a podcast right now, and <laughs> it's been kind of a mess, but whenever you're branding and redoing things, which we are right now, um, you have to do a branding guideline. A branding guideline is like the fonts, the colors, how are you going to use them? You're coming up with your why. Why are we doing this podcast? What makes our podcast stand out? Podcast is like listening to the radio on your phone, and it's just an interview. For those of you who don't know what a podcast is, there you go. Um, <laughs> So my grandpa asked me the other day, what is a podcast? So I figured I should explain it. And so in the midst of this, this is just, I mean, this is just a project, but we have to know our why, right? We have to know why we do what we do, but we also have to know that what we do isn't what gives us value. And in the very beginning, that is what God is telling the Israelites. You have these people that just came out of slavery and they've been making bricks, and for generations after generations, imagine if the husband got injured and couldn't go to work and make bricks. What happens to the family? What happens to the kids? What happens to the wives when they're in slavery? Yeah, it's big. It really is big. And I think we need to like realize that because like, if we don't realize that Genesis is all about rest, Genesis is about how when humans were created— God's teaching this, not all of Genesis, I should say the first few chapters, is God's teaching us this lesson about rest. He's teaching us about our identity. Then we're not going to understand when we get to Romans. 
we're not going to understand the weight of last week's message. Because if you don't understand where you started from, then it's not going to make a difference on where you're going or what he lays on your heart to do. Does this make sense? Are you guys following? I'm not really following my notes, but I'm glad you guys are following. It's good. Great. Okay, okay, okay. We're also... (laughs) Chapter 2. Have you guys ever read chapter 2? You know, where Eve makes the big no-no and listens to the snake, which I would just like to point out if you go... Is it chapter 2? No, it's chapter 3. If you go and you look at, like, verse 14 of chapter 3, verse 14, it says, God cursed the animal. So, the Lord God said to the serpent... Because you have done this, cursed, you are above all livestock and all animals. You will crawl on your belly. I would just like to point out that that is a funny statement since we all call it the snake already. Wasn't it already crawling on its belly? Just something to ponder on. This gives you another perspective of like sometimes, I mean, you have this talking thing, serpent, we'll call it, that's reasoning with woman. And, and there's a difference. The, the snake or the serpent is not coming over and hitting her. Hey, you better eat this fruit or I'm going to keep hitting you. It's not physical. What's happening is mental. The serpent's using reasoning, guys, against her to lie to her. Not even lie. He's twisting the truth in ways and making her question so we're going we're gonna to get into that a little bit. We're, we're going to talk about how if you realize all of chapter 3 is about being naked. It's all about nakedness. Just all. Oh, that makes you uncomfortable. I'm sorry. But it starts with, <laughs> at the very beginning, the serpent says, did God really say? And you have to put the emphasis on say. Because if you put it anywhere else, you're missing it. It's like, God, like, the say is important because if you, did God really say that? Like, if I was hanging out with Candace and Candace was like, hey, Amber, don't blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay. And then I was hanging out with um, Natalie and Natalie was like, well, did, did mom really say that? She's questioning if I remember what mom said correctly. She's making me rethink it, which if you look at it, <laughs> on verse 3, Eve says, You must not eat from the fruit, uh, the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it. That was not what was told. It wasn't, If you touch it, you will die. That's not, if we go back, anybody know where it says? Yeah. Verse 17 in chapter 2, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right? So as this conversation goes on, not touch it or you will die. Also, no, we're not going. Okay. (laughs) You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Wait a second like God. Genesis 1, 27 says that we are made in God's image. She already knows that she's like God. She's made in his image. See how things are kind of getting twisted here? Knowing good and evil, when the women saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable, let's um, highlight the fact that that's the first word Like, first time we've heard the word desirable. It's the first um, time we've heard about desire in the Bible is right here. For wisdom, she took some of and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. (laughs) Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and together and made co- coverings for themselves. 
Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called out to them, to man, where are you? And um, the original like wording of where are you, it's not, I can't find you. It's the question of you're not where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be walking with me in the garden. You're not walking with me in the garden, so where are you? And I think that's important because God's not, it's not like God doesn't know where they are. He knows, but he's like, but you're not where you're supposed to be, and that's what I'm going to ask you. So it's like if, let's mother-daughter situation. Candace gets to the church, and she's like, where are you, Natalie? Like, you're, not so, you're supposed to be here. Where did you go? That is the question. That is what, what they, they're saying or he's saying. He answered, I, hear, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid. Hmm, that's the first time we've heard the word afraid also. Because I was naked. So I hid, and, uh, and he said, Who told you you were naked? I think we read past that so fast. And the question of it is so heavy. Because God's not automatically, how dare you, I know what you did, jump to assumptions. God's saying, who told you this? Whose voices are you listening to? Because that's not what I've called you to be. A few people have asked me a couple times, because not many of you knew who was speaking today, um, but a few of you did, and you said, what are you teaching on? I said, you'll see. And I want to, a few times I wanted to name it like, you know, identity. But then I don't just see identity as what I'm talking about. I'm talking about rest and identity. And I'm talking about if you don't realize the value of who you are and who God created you to be, if you start listening to the other voices who are going to tell you something different instead of listening to what your father has called you to be, then he's going to be asking you the same question of who told you you were naked because that is not what I told you. And when we allow that in, when we allow ourselves to listen to those other voices, and those other things, that's where fear comes in. Shame comes in. They weren't shameful of their nakedness. They were like, this is how God created us. This is who we are. So why are we shameful about the way we laugh? You know, some people hate their laughs. Or some people don't like this. Or some people, for, in my experience, I grew up being told, like, you... Aren't, you don't have good reading comprehension. So I was put in a special needs class for it. And I would stutter when reading. And am I still the smoothest reader nowadays? No. But I have learned to slow down and realize, I have to remind myself to slow down because I get excited about it. And I've realized that I'm only what I allow people, if, if I allow people to define me one way, that's what I'm going to become. But if I allow to hear what I've been called, then that's what I get to be. It's our choice because it, it's fear, it's identity, it's choice. And it all comes down to choice. And Hope Church, we have a choice. We have a really big choice. Is you get to show up on Sundays. And I don't know why you come to church on Sunday. I, and I don't mean that in a, like, you shouldn't come to church on Sunday, <laughs> obviously. Um, but you should ask yourself, what's, what's the weight behind it? Why do you do what you do? What's the worth? Where are you finding your worth? Because if you're, if you're like the Israelites, when you are reading this, this story and the narrative being told, ooh, that sounded like it hurt. Oh, it's, it should be all right. Um, if you're the Israelites and you are reading this, you've been told your worth comes in the number of bricks you make. Okay. Um, Robin, John, if your kids grew up and people were, and you just told them their worth is in them becoming doctors, what do you think, I just picked a career, what do you think they would be striving after that? 
There's no breaks. There's no rest. There's no purpose. No, you want to be happy with that. As parents, you're like, well, I wouldn't tell my kids that. I want my kids to be who they are, right? You want them to discover. We have generations. I've been here since I was little, little. <laughs> and there's generations of generations I've watched come through this church. And some stay and some go. But I think there's... <laughs> Chris is a young pastor. I was not planning on going here. Um, Chris is a young pastor, and here I am, much younger than Chris. I'm also a woman, which I don't know how some of you feel about that, but we'll just sort it out, pray about it. Oh. Um, here's a young pastor, and things are changing, and there's things shifting, but you know what I see it as? I see it as a really great time to plant more seeds that go deeper. I see it as a time for our youth to know that they have a family who have their back. I see it as a time for there to be a shift. And we have the choice. But if, if we don't realize the voices we're listening to, then we're not going to make the right choice. If we don't realize that we have the authority and the choice, then we're just going to show up on Sundays and sit back and say, this is okay. I don't know if you've heard, my stepdad likes to walk around and say, Amber doesn't like how churches ran. <laughs> she doesn't like going, to, or she doesn't like church, or something along those lines. Um, and I was like, Robert, you got to stop. <laughs> People are, are not going to understand unless they talk to me. But the last two years, I've been in an Acts church. I've been in a church that gathers, and they don't have a setup like this. They say, all right, like one person might kind of lead for the day, and they say, okay, Holy Spirit, what do you have? And is that scary? And for a lot of older generations, which, I mean, all of you are much older than me, just just making, I'm, I'm pointing out the elephant in the, the room, but... It's a different shift, but it's not a bad shift. And shifting to say, hey, we're going to show up, and I'm going to believe I hear Holy Spirit. And there's times where I was like, Lord, I don't know if this is you or just the thought I had because I had a conversation with this person, and I know they're struggling with this, but I have this word, and it's encouraging, but I don't know if it's from you or not. And so I had to make the choice of, do I keep that to myself, or do I walk over and say, hey, I know that you might have this, and we might, I don't know if this is from the Lord. I just know this is on, like bothering me, and I need to share it with you. So I'm going to share it with you. And you know, you know what that's doing? That's choosing a voice in the moment. That's saying, I'm going to listen to who God's called me to be. I'm going to listen to the inheritance that he's given us. I'm going to take up the weapons that he's given me, and I'm going to, like, take a step and shoot an arrow and see what happens. And I'm going to tell the person, hey, this might be from the Lord, it might not be, pray about it. And the next time I'm going to be like, oh, no, this is definitely from the Lord. And I can go and I can share. But you don't know until you try. Back to language class. I can't learn language unless I try. <laughs> All my other classmates decided not to show up last Tuesday. Um, one of them was on family vacation. The other one had some emergency came up. So all valid points, right? But it left me in Hindi class. So I'm on a video call with a woman who is in a foreign country, and she speaks Hindi, like, fluently. That's her native tongue. And I, um, I have to describe these picture books for almost a solid two hours. And here's the thing. Sometimes we need to be put in a pressure cooker where we have no way out and we have to just try. Because by the end of my two hours, I was like, oh, so you put the subject, the object, the action. Oh, oh, I'm like seeing it all. I'm like, this is very different from English. But I'm like, don't think about English right now. Just think Hindi. And there's, there's a difference when you change your mindset and when you allow yourself to be in that pressure cooker. I don't even know where I'm at anymore. <sighs> I 
I think the other, going back to Genesis 3, if your child, oh, okay, my, my stepbrother Christopher thinks knives are the coolest thing when he was younger. He's older now. But his dad didn't just leave sharp knives laying around everywhere. Is that going to be safe for a child that is fascinated with knives in the first place? And as a young boy, no offense, guys, but sometimes you guys get a little bit more crazy with things. <laughs> no. So you could ask the same question. If, if God loved his kids, he loved Adam and Eve, right? Why do you put a tree that he knew was tempting to them in the garden? And here's, here's my answer to that. Also, I cannot take credit for any of this research. A lot of this comes from a podcast I've been listening to. It's called Bema. They go like verse by verse, and it's been really interesting. Um, but this question was one of the questions they asked on it. And I thought that their perspective was really interesting. Um, as you see, as you keep reading, God is a God who knows when to say enough. He knows when to say, if, I, if he was chiseling a sculpture, like, he has to stop. Or if he doesn't stop, it's going to ruin the whole thing. He knows when to say enough, and he needs us to know that too. So he needs us to trust him. He needed Adam and Eve to trust him, that he's going to provide everything else they need. They have all the other gardens or trees. They have all the other trees in the garden to pick from that, that they need to know that they can trust him in that and say, it's enough for us. We don't need anything else. And in that moment, what got Eve was her thoughts and the reasoning of the serpent. So when it talks about, you know, um, oh, man, I just lost it. It's the guard your thoughts, take captive your thoughts. I don't know why I pointed to you guys. <laughs> take captive your thoughts um, wherever that is in Scripture. That is so important because if we don't take captive our thoughts, we're not realizing what we already have. And we're not realizing, I mean, take it to the Lord and be like, hey, is this you? Because there's a really good chance it's not him. And what he's tempting you with is just another tree when he's giving you 50,000 other trees to pick from. And he's like, no, 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 don't go to that tree. You have enough, and I'm going to make sure you have enough because I love you, I trust you, I care about you. And that's why it's so important for us to realize also that this whole poem in chapter 1 is interrupted by the creation of humans. The first job that Adam had was naming the creatures because God's saying, you're not another animal. We are not animals, and because we're not animals, we don't just go eat from any tree. We realize what trees God's given us and which ones he's told us to stay away from. And we trust him in that. Woke up one morning this week and was just like, Romans 5 never happens to me. So everybody turn to Romans 5. Whoever gets there first gets a fake air candy. Are you ready? Set, Go! Ready? You ready for it? Uh, see, it's sugar-free, guys. People with diabetes don't have to worry about it. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. Wait, wait, wait. So we have peace with God. Can we all recognize that? So if you're feeling discomfort or fear or anxiety, you prob that's not from the Lord. <laughs> Let's just recognize that. There, wasn't, there was peace in the garden until she picked from the wrong tree. 
And then that's when fear came in. That's when shame came in. When they started listening to the wrong voice. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. I feel like this is something you have to read through slowly, so I'm taking my time. Because I think it needs to sit in. I read this three times that morning, and was like, I don't know why I'm reading this. It's like, isn't it the same? Same thing I've been reading? But I did the whole study on Genesis yesterday, and it opened this up, and I was like, wow. So if we remember what we are initially created for. Remember our worth, our value. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace, which we now stand. And we boast in the hope. There's hope, guys. Not just because you're at Hope Church. Of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. That's hard to do. I think that we, we used to, I went to a leadership academy, and um, we would talk about leaders making the next generation's floor their ceiling. So I, John was the main pastor of me growing up. So his ceiling, as far as he could go, should be my floor. We would, make, we would make this saying, we would say, double it. <laughs> double the inheritance, double it. Until I realized after I'd been saying that for a little bit, I was like, how much, when you say double it, you're saying double the responsibility. Responsibility is not, adulting is not fun. And I know most of you have been in it for a while. <laughs> But let me tell you, when you get back around to it, it's still not the most exciting thing. And I think that when we read things like sufferings, we're like, well, I mean, I live in a free country, and I have this, and I have that. But sometimes our sufferings look different. Sometimes it looks like being the odd person out, or that person at work that always is this or that. All right, we'll keep going. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Okay, so back to the tree. Hope, shame came when she ate from this tree, when she listened to the wrong voice, when she decided to realize or if think that what the serpent was saying had more value than what the Lord had been calling her and saying she was. When she decided to stop trusting in what the Lord said he would provide. Um, put us to shame. But God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has, given, has been given to us. If you don't realize, guys, if you don't realize your worth, if you're just another person coming out of slavery, people of Israel had been in slavery for 440 years, right? Their worth was found in bricks and the numbers they could make in the numbers they could make. If we find our worth, does that sound familiar? In the numbers you can make, in the career you choose, in the house you have, in the car you have, in the friends you have, in the things you do, in the things you do, then the things that God did on the cross have no value. 
It's a big one. Because if you don't realize that none of what you have matters, and the only thing that matters is realizing your day doesn't start with doing, it starts with resting, then you're not going to realize what he did on the cross, what we celebrated last week, has value. You're going to just numb yourself to it of, yeah, Easter, egg hunts, woo Thank you, Lord. We praise and glorify you. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins. But I'm co- totally going to like disregard the fact that you've called me to be this. I'm going to listen to these voices. I'm going to find my worth in the slavery that I don't have to be enslaved to. Can we just let that sink in? Verse 6. You see, at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. (laughs) I'd like to read that again. Christ died for the ungodly. That's not just the people in the church. It's not for the people who think that they have it all together. And I think we often um, forget that. You don't have to do anything to receive what's already been given to you. Very rarely will anyone die for righteous people. Though for good, a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. Wow. Once again, it's not about what you do. Right? You can be a terrible person. God's still like, hey, I got you. In other words, hey, I have uh, died for your sins, taking care of all of it. But God demonstrated his own, his own love for us. In this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I think this is the part where I... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Never mind. God's teaching them in the beginning to do what? What's, I mean, more evening and then morning, what's he teaching them? Rest. He's teaching them their value is found in what? Him. Is our value found in what we do? So (laughs) I have this, uh, you, at one point I would come to the Hope Church and um, they'd be like, oh, you're the missionary. I really don't like that term. (laughs) I always said thank you, but I just left it. Because here's the thing. I'm not the missionary. I am Amber. I'm Amber who has chosen these choices and made these choices to do these things. But honestly, just listening to the Lord and jumping off bridges and hoping the Lord's got a bungee rope on me. But all of us together our missionaries, absolutely. We all have a calling on our life, and I know the intentions of the people saying it, and I understand that. So I, no offense there, honestly. You're only offendable if you choose to be. I didn't mean that. Anyways, so... <laughs> I was like, man, is the mic there? So we're enough... He's teaching us to rest. First thing, rest, to know you're enough, to know your identity, to know who you are, know who he created you to be, to know the voices you're supposed to be listening to versus the voices you are. Romans 5, he's like, it's all taken care of. This is what I did for you, and I did it not because of what you did, but because of who you are. Parents don't love their kids because of how much chores their kids do. Parents love their kids because they created them and saw them grow up and and care for them. And it's their job. (laughs) There's a book that Alan Smoke gave me. Um, 
<laughs> and I read like a quarter of it. Uh, but there's some really good points in it. And it says, uh, it's written by this guy named Sandy Anderson. It says, your mistakes did not cancel out your destiny. Hmm. It's the only part of your history. I like that. Thank you, sister, for just chatting with me. Like, He also said, it doesn't matter who you used to be. What matters is what you choose to become. It is your history, yeah. But our history doesn't have to become our current. <laughs> There's always going to be things to do. <laughs> and I just need you guys to realize I'm preaching to myself this whole time. Because this is something I'm continually learning I can know who I am in Christ and who Christ has created me to be, but that does not mean that those voices do not get loud. Those lies do not get loud. Yeah. It means that you have to keep pushing forward. You have to persevere. Isn't that what we just wrote, read, not wrote, read in Romans 5? So, I don't know, what time is it? Oh, great. Wow. I don't really know what time church ends, so I think I'm on time. I was like, is it noon or 1230? <laughs> oh, okay, great. Everybody sit back, relax. I'm on a ride. Um, if you can open up your little note you made earlier that you said, I am. When I was at um, the Leadership Academy I attended, we had a teaching that we had to do at the end of um, the nine months I was there. And I made a video called I Am. And I had all the people in my class. It was such a cool setup. Um, There's like a wall with all the dreams that people had given, like God had given them um, in the backdrop. And then this light like shining, so it made the rings around their eyes, you know, like perfect stage lighting. It was just really, really cool. Um, and I had everyone say, I am, and fill in the blank. And as I, I had them view it for my teaching, and then I did a little speaking afterwards, and I ended up saying, realizing you can show up at this leadership academy, and you can totally waste your time and waste everybody's time and the money that's been given for you to get there. Or you can show up and choose it. You can choose in and make the hard, vulnerable things happen. You can talk about the things that you haven't talked about. You can choose to dive into scripture. You can choose to like spend your Saturday helping this person or doing that. It's your choice. So I want you all to write down, I am, and then fill in the blank. After hearing, you know, you're not created because of what you do, for to do what you do. You're created to rest in him. You're created with worth given from him. So anybody have anything um, with that in mind, like the I am that they, <laughs> that, that you want to declare over your life? You know, you've had all these lies and these things that people have been telling you. Maybe someone in my situation, I felt like I grew up with a perspective from the education system telling me I am not smart. So that was a journey I had to go through and say, I am smart. Psh, I am really smart. Does that mean I like, would get A's in every class I take? No, I'm smart in my own ways, but I'm smart. So anybody uh, have the boldness out there to share what maybe they wrote or what they've, they want to declare that they are? Let's hear it. Yes. Love it. Oh, I love it. Love it. Same. Yes. Jesse, yeah.
That's so powerful. Wow. God's so cool. Yeah, Vicky. Yeah. You are. Believe it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Let's hear it. Declare it. You can stand it up and shout it if you want. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm